good morning uh, i i think the discussions uh, that we just had about disease prevention in neonatal populations type 1 diabetes they were really inspiring uh, the talk that i listened to uh, by dr jim wilson unbelievably amazing uh, and we are going to continue on the same theme here uh, which is actually very relevant given that cpath is launching a new consortium that is focused on lysosomal diseases the name of that consortium is critical path for lysosomal storage diseases and uh, among many things that we want to uh, target and work on that consortium is uh, at least some discussion focus on uh, gene therapies disease prevention aspects and uh, issues and challenges in conducting uh, gene therapy type of clinical trials in the lysosomal story to this space i think that there are several people still out uh, so i'm requesting if you want to uh, listen into this session please make your way down here yeah i think so So we're just running just a tiny little bit late, but we have a lot of leeway built it into the session, so it should be fine. Okay, so the topic of discussion is uh, disease prevention, specifically focusing on cell and gene therapies in lysosomal storage diseases, uh, and perhaps in addition to LSDs, uh, some discussion focus on other pediatric indications as well. We wanted to have this slightly broader sort of a discussion, and uh, as a matter of uh, uh, providing uh, industry perspective on what is the current state of affairs in cell and gene therapies in drug development specifically also focusing on cell and gene therapies where the field is going to go in the near future uh, as jim wilson was saying the future is gene therapies and gene, that future is now here uh, i wanted to invite uh, my um, friend colleague and uh, uh, co-collaborator co from uh, International Neonatal Consortium, Tom Miller, who is the Vice President and Global Head of Acute Chronic and Pediatric Disease Nucleus at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. He's also the industry co-director at our International Neonatal Consortium. He's going to talk about his perspectives, and then we're going to follow up this uh, uh, his presentation with a, uh, with a panel session, question and answer session. So, Tom, thank you. Thank you, Kunwaljit. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for, to folks that are on the phone, and uh, thank you very much to CPATH for, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I suspect at least maybe one or two of you in the audience are wondering um, uh, why the heck is a guy from uh, the INC leadership team opening up the lysosomal storage disease um, uh, topic? Uh, and I'll do my best to make that uh, a little bit relevant uh, and hopefully clear as, as we go through. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, the the last presentation from from Dr. Wilson. A very, certainly a very um, tough act to follow, but I hope to give a little bit more of a practical perspective as we look towards the clinic and some of the unique challenges that I suspect are um, going to be relevant for perhaps um, most everyone in this room, independent of um, which part of the ecosystem you're in. So I'm going to give a couple of perspectives on um, what is, what, from my from my uh, vantage point, uh, the very rapidly evolving regenerative medicine ecosystem, and very specifically what this means uh, for infants. Next slide, please. Um, I am an employee of Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Um, we we do have a, a a very strong and stated and widespread interest in the regenerative medicine field. So wanted to make that clear before we jump in. Next slide, please. So a couple of topics for discussion, um, um, a little bit of a snapshot of what is the, the state of the art of the field today? What, uh, what does the ecosystem look like as this grows, continues to grow rapidly? Um, I see a number of tailwinds for this field um, that, that are pushing, uh, propelling uh, th this field forward. And uh, uh, Professor Wilson gave a good couple of examples of that, but there are, there are many, many, many um, development programs within the ecosystem, and we'll touch on that in a moment. There are also um, a number of clusters of activity within the field as well. 
I find that our that our, that our industry often um, uh, finds attractiveness to certain areas of development um, uh, at roughly the same time, which which builds some tonnage in a particular area. And I find that this gives us an opportunity to learn uh, from each other, um, particularly as we're we're all trying to figure this out together. Um, there's significant activity. Um, in the LSD and in the LROD space, um, as as Dr. Wilson alluded to, I'd say this is one of the most um, uh, heavily focused areas uh, across the entirety of the ecosystem currently. And I'll touch on uh, some context that I see there. And very specifically to the to the point I started with about the relevance of um, why I was asked to to address this topic with you all today was that um, it's it's become clear to me and hopefully will be clear to all of you as we go through and continue this discussion that there are a number of cross-cutting themes across all of the consortia that are participating uh, in the scientific breakthrough session today. Um, the, the neonatal and um, infant population will be a, a non-trivial component of all of these drug development initiatives. And this is an area um, that I, INC has amassed a, a tremendous amount of expertise in. So we see a, a, a significant opportunity for collaboration and hope to convince you all uh, so you see it as well. Next slide. So I did a, 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 a quasi-scientific uh, assessment using clintrials.org. I, I did this for the first time uh, when I was asked to speak on this topic a couple of years ago at this venue. And um, it's pretty pretty easy to follow the the, the waterfall. Um, I look at two categories of in the regenerative medicine space, the emerging stem cell-based therapies, which are certainly relevant to um, at least one of our new consortia uh, here today, uh, and the emerging gene-based therapies that are uh, relevant to, to a number of uh, the consortia here and um, not participating in this venue, but certainly have relevance in, in other aspects of, of CPATH. And then on the, on the the um, the the uh, y uh, the y axis, for lack of a better term, I looked at. I started with a number of unique identifiers in clin trials, and you could see in both cases there's quite a number of uh, of of uh, hit points when 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 you when you push the return button. There's a lot of noise in in clintrials.gov if if you're if you're not familiar with it. So that's not really all that informative. So my next cut was um, what what number of these studies are interventional um, as opposed to natural history studies or observational studies, uh, so forth and so on. Still quite a number of, of studies in, in development. Um, well, what what proportion of those are sponsored trials? Um, we, we still are in the thousands in, in both cases. Um, now a little bit more relevant for our conversation today. What's uh, what's the number of studies that allow for enrollment uh, of children? And we're in the several hundred range for sponsored interventional trials. And finally, what what number of these studies allow to enroll um, down to the neonatal period? And when I did this um, calculus only three years ago, that number was a handful of trials. Um, but as you can see here, the the, the growth has been nonlinear. And, and I suspect that this will continue to be the case because one of the, the prevailing themes um, in as we look across the ecosystem is intervention as early in life as risk benefit will, will allow. And in perhaps not all, but in many cases, I suspect that will be um, in infancy to perhaps intercept disease before um, profound signs and symptoms of disease even initiate. Next slide. So I touched on this topic of tailwinds. Um, from my perspective, I see certainly a, a, a good couple of them that will continue to propel um, this, this field forward. Number one, um, there's been rapid advancements in, in the technology. Dr. Wilson touched on, on a couple of these. Um, some of the early generation um, uh, AAV uh, vector delivery systems were, were did not had a number of non-trivial um, considerations that we the teams had to think about um, uh, from a from a safety surveillance uh, perspective in vulnerable populations, but that continues to improve, and and I suspect um, uh, we'll, we will see significant progress on this front in in the coming um, years and and decades. Um, there's been uh, legislative changes that I think have changed a little bit of the way that um, many of the sponsors think, um, and with I, I suspect there'll be a much more of a an industry wide pivot towards precision medicine and and rare disease. Some of the 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 biotech companies that are joining uh, us here at this venue um, are myopically focused on on precision medicine and and rare disease. But I think even the large companies in the ecosystem, this will be a, a trend to to look forward to. 
Um, as we've heard from a number of our um, health authority executive representatives at, at the meeting, um, I'm seeing quite a bit of favorable change in the ecosystem as well, where there are now a number of incentives, a number of opportunities to have more real-time engagement um, to help um, the sponsors through some fairly complex questions. These, these development programs uh, in early innings uh, are, are much more complex than others that I have had to think about previously. Uh, and I suspect I'm not alone in, in that experience. As I hinted uh, a moment ago, um, I think the concept of life cycle strategy is going to change for how we develop these medicines, where we may have a starting place where um, the collective ecosystem believes we have an appropriate benefit risk consideration to intervene. But in many cases, again, although in early innings, what we're, what we're observing is that life cycle strategy may mean moving earlier and earlier in life. Um, there have been conversations and, and, uh, in, in, in some early review papers, even, uh, publications, um, addressing the concept in, in certain circumstances for in utero intervention, um, with, with certain genetic medicines. So, Brave new world for sure. Um, uh, it's exhilarating um, and for me at least a little terrifying at the same time. Um, but we're we're trying to do our best uh, uh, the best we can. And I think as importantly, as we see so much advancement on the therapeutic side, we're seeing very exciting developments and advancements on the diagnostic side as well, um, with the advent of rapid whole genome sequencing. And I'll touch on a little bit more relevance on that point in a moment. Next slide, please. So um, there's been an incredible advancement um, and momentum on, on this topic as well. Currently, 13 states have either public or private coverage, um, reimbursement coverage for rapid whole genome sequencing. And this is um, not a happy accident. I think there's really a, a strong data-driven rationale for, for why this has been the case. Uh, number one, it's, I think, clearly um, been, been identified as a, as a cost-effective initiative and a cost-savings initiative. Um, in one of the panels, um, Dr. Davis referenced a, a, a very specific tactical experience that he had where he was able to secure reimbursement for a number of traditional um, diagnostic tools um, that took much more time and almost certainly much more money um, to, to ultimately get to the, to the right place. Um, the early application of rapid genome, uh, rapid whole uh, genome sequencing, uh, will shorten the diagnostic odyssey and and significantly improve the diagnostic yield. Um, uh, Stephen Kingsmore and John uh, Davis and others have recently published uh, a study uh, that they refer to as the Gemini study, where they very clearly demonstrate um, much more precision and accuracy in in diagnostic yield. So for many for many reasons, this appears to be um, a, a, a new and, and very potentially important tool for for all of us. And I suspect um, if I'm asked to speak on this topic in the coming years, we'll see much more blue um, on on the slide in the United States and, and hopefully expansion outside the United States as well. Next slide. So. As we start to think about where where do we see the most activity in in the field, um, sometimes the the tail does wag the dog, and we we have to think about where can we effectively assure that we um, transvect uh, or or graft these regenerative technologies with with reasonable accuracy. Um, where we do a pretty good job targeting um, the liver uh, today. And um, there's been some very early successes um, and and um, expansion of growth of interest in um, in 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 the eye, specifically in back of the eye uh, disorders, inherited um, uh, retinopathies, et cetera. Um, there's quite a bit bit of interest in the field in neurodegenerative diseases in adults. Um, quite a number of sponsors are focusing on Parkinson's and Huntington's patients. Um, but pediatrics has been um, front and center in, in early innings of the field development as well, um, most notably with uh, the SMA1 subtype, which life cycle is continuing to grow on that front. So fingers crossed. And quite a number of programs targeting various muscular dystrophies. Duchenne's, of course, um, the, has been the, the area of most interest, but we're seeing much more broadening in, um, in, in other muscular dystrophies as well. Um, in the liposomal storage disorder, um, liposome-related organelle disorder space, we're seeing a tremendous amount of activity as well. 
which will now allow us to transition in, into um, the discussion. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite eager to learn what a number of the companies uh, that are here are up to, um, but quite a bit of activity in the in the sphingolipidosis space, the mucopolysaccharidosis space, um, glycogen storage disorders, um, and, and quite a number of others. Next slide. So busy slide that, that details um, quite a number of um, liposomal disorders and, and LRODs as well. Um, but uh, as I indicated, and as Dr. Wilson had indicated, um, quite a bit of activity um, in, in, in not only his own shop, but in, in several others around the ecosystem in the mucopolysaccharidosis space. Um, uh, the, uh, the Pompeii space is, a, is another area of, of active interest and investigation across the industry, both in pin onset uh, as well as late, late onset disease. Next slide. So how does this relate to the, um, the diversity of the ecosystem that we have here today with, with four consortia, two new um, within the CPATH ecosystem and, and INC um, here? Well, as I alluded to, for many, um, not all of these programs, um, pediatric patients uh, down to infancy will um, either um, start as a primary patient population or perhaps become a, a relevant patient population at the life, life cycle of the development um, process moves towards completion. Um, a key area um, uh, with it within the field um, is monogenic disorders, uh, including uh, many LSDs and, and uh, LROs. Um, and within the subset, uh, many of these orders um, exhibit manifestation disease very early in life, uh, including uh, as early as the neonatal period. Um, this is an area that we bring quite a bit of expertise to. I could tell you, um, having been at this now for the better part of almost 30 years, doing studies in infants is really, really hard. Um, there's and, and it's hard from a multifactorial perspective. Um, nailing down the, the integrated clinical regulatory strategy is an is a important first step, but then you have to execute these studies. Um, and I find that um, trying to think about execution of these rare disease studies in a single country um, is, is probably not a, a winning strategy for, for a sponsor. Um, we really do need to think globally for many of these uber rare diseases to ensure that we have enough catch basin um, to, to identify these patients. And as you start to think globally, there are, very, there are medical practice differences that you have to take into account. There are cultural differences with respect to how parents think about participation in clinical trials. All of these things are critical success factors. And for the, for the new teams that are bringing forward potentially very exciting uh, new technologies, this is an area where I think the INC could be particularly helpful for you. Um, key challenges with with um, these pediatric and and um, and and uh, other rare disease trials in in general. Number one, of course, children can't advocate for themselves. Um, so you, this will require an exercise where informed consent and understanding of the application and perceived risk with these medicines um, must be consented by the parent or the or the caretaker. Um, and I could tell you for sure, um, this represents a, a non-trivial challenge um, as it relates to efficiency of attempted consent to secured consent. And as I've spoken to countless academic colleagues uh, that run their own clinical trials, this is not a, an experience that's unique to industry. It seems that this is a, a shared challenge that we, we all have. Um, there are oftentimes very long enrollment periods and um, many trials simply um, uh, the, the study teams become fatigued with the, the protracted uh, enrollment period. And I've seen this movie more times than I've cared to count. Uh, we unblind studies before we've reached our pre-specified objectives. And guess what happens? We, we don't achieve our primary objective, more research is needed and time to do another study. It's a very inefficient process. So we, we have to get better at this. Um, Long-term follow-up challenges um, for the regenerative medicines, well, before I even get there, for, for the folks that do pediatric clinical trials, you're, you're well aware that long-term follow-ups are, are, are usually required by, by health authorities. Um, for the regenerative medicines, you could expect even longer-term follow-ups uh, for your patients. And I find the, the, the country where I've met the most challenge in, in effectuating long-term follow-ups 
is this one. Um, and the reason for this is because in the U.S., people change their medical homes fairly frequently. Um, in other countries and other parts of the world, I've found um, a, a much more um, successful strategy in, in assuring um, long-term follow-up where the medical home remains consistent through the follow-up period. Um, and um, we, we touched on a couple of times the, the, the challenges that we sometimes have with um, discordant um, perspectives from various um, health authorities ar around the globe. But you've also heard that there are a number of initiatives that all, all the big health authorities are, are working towards to try to address this pain point, um, hopefully in, a, in an efficient way. Next slide. So back to um, clinical regulatory strategy, you know, we often think about that as as one part and then it's time to do the study. But I view them as as very much um, integrated because the way we choose to design the study may impact your your operational throughput of patient access and, and enrollment. And one area that I found some uh, personal success um, with my team at Bayer um, has been through employing um, use of uh, real world evidence for regulatory decision making purposes. Um, we're going to touch on this a little bit later, so I'm, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on this topic, but maybe to plant a seed now that we'll, we'll come back to a very important concept for teams to consider um, on, on this front, if this is an area that you're interested in exploring, is the concept of fit for purpose. What is it that you intend to use the real world data slash evidence for? Um, are, are you using it to enrich your patient population? Um, some of these um, monogenic diseases have um, uh, homozygotic and heterozygotic manifestations. Do we want to try to understand differences between those manifestations of disease? Um, are we using it to um, um, limit the demography of patients that we enroll in our studies? Perhaps uh, EMR registry data might be helpful for you in, in those type of decisions. But if you're, if you're interested in using the data to um, control either fully or partially a, a pivotal trial, um, understandably, the standards should be very, very different um, because we need to make sure that we have appropriate um, quality control and assurance of the data and that the data that's being um, advocated for for use for this purpose is representative of current clinical practice. More on that to come. This is an area that we are very, very interested in at INC because um, this has relevance, um, not only to the regenerative medicine field, um, but all, to all pediatric rare disease trials, including the ones that we, we've all struggled with for, for a very long time. Um, so um, I ask the audience to, to you know, recall this, this um, seed planting when we get to our session a little bit later today. But I, I have found that thinking smartly through um, these type of approaches in design of clinical trials has led towards uh, operational success as well. Um, so with that, I'll um, pause. I'll give the mic back to Ken Walchit, and I'll look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, to be honest, uh, I was actually amazed to see the number of uh, clinical trials that are already, uh, uh, you know, uh, enrolling children and using gene therapies. Uh, like we're just gonna right now go on to to our uh, panel discussion, and I'm actually going to invite our panelists on the stage here. I'm honored to have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hart from Seabur, uh, Dr. Gavin Imperato from Seabur, Tom Miller, you're already here, uh, uh, Dr. Galina Nestrova from uh, UID, uh, Laurie Turner from uh, National Neiman Pick Disease Foundation, and uh, Dr. Jim Wilson from University of Pennsylvania. I think we're all here, so we can um, get started uh, with the panel discussion today. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a pleasure for uh, you to have something here. You wanna, or you can sit down here. That's fine. Um, I'm just gonna get because Tom, you know, just just uh, got started with. Uh, with, uh, I guess, uh, uh, such an extensive uh, discussion about the current state of uh, development in cell and gene therapies. I'm just going to go directly to our uh, regulatory colleagues uh, from CBER uh, to perhaps uh, get their perspective and feedback. 
uh, in terms of uh, if if you have any comments about what specific regulatory considerations are crucial when evaluating uh, cell and gene therapy clinical trials, specifically for lysosomal disease, but also in general for other pediatric populations also. How do you uh, balance the considerations related to safety, efficacy in these therapies, um, you know, um, and how might these considerations differ based on uh, for example, age of the patient, if you're evaluating them in neonates versus early childhood versus late childhood. So it's a question to uh, to our uh, FDA colleagues, but anybody else who wants to answer that is, is perfectly good as well. Um, all right. That is a uh, big topic. Yeah, um, absolutely. But as far as benefit risk, that is essentially the big thing that we deal with constantly. Um, and so essentially it needs to be individualized. There's not a one size fits all approach. So essentially it depends upon the product. It depends upon the disease space. It depends upon the phase of development. And so, um, the other thing is it really also depends upon the patient community and the risk that they are willing to tolerate in the uncertainties. Um, it's a very, very exciting time for gene therapy, um, but there are definitely risks um, that come with these regenerative medicine therapies. And so we need to um, consider what is appropriate um, at the different phases of development and the context. Thanks. Gavin, did you have any comments as well? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would echo what, uh, what Dr. Hart said. I think, you know, that the, um, the challenges are obviously very well known um, to this audience to, um, to do uh, drug development for, um, for these vulnerable um, uh, patient populations. Um, we're evolving. Um, we're evolving with our industry sponsors and, and our academic sponsors and dialogue like this is is enormously helpful for us in in helping us to evolve our thinking. But um, I think Dr. Hart, you know, emphasized a really critical point that because of the uniqueness of these products and the development programs, um, it's very difficult for us to give broad blanket statements about um, you know how we will interpret regulatory statutes and apply regulatory authority in the context of any any given development program. Um, but we want to really give the feedback to um, to industry that. Um, we encourage you to be as forthcoming as possible in terms of how you're thinking about overall developments. It's it's very, very helpful, particularly in early phase development, for us to have a sense of of the considerations you're thinking about. And we encourage you to be free in the in the language that you use. We don't expect you to have all the answers either um, when you're early in development. So the more forthcoming um, our industry sponsors are in terms of the things they're thinking about, um, when those are shared with us, it, it helps us to think through um, uh, some of the key regulatory considerations. And we're really, um, you know, so excited about all the um, all the programs that are in development now and looking forward to supporting you. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I wanted to invite our uh, uh, guest, uh, Dr. Galina Nestrova, for her comments on like uh, technological standpoints, because I think uh, she has done a lot of work on this one. But I would like to invite her on the stage because I believe she has slides to present. Uh, if you want to just sit here and talk about the slides, that's perfectly fine as well. You are able to say it. So, you know, go ahead and, and talk about your uh, comments. Okay, and thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll, I was asked by CPAF Institute, and thank you so much for that, to give updates on the new technologies and the session called disease prevention. So what is a disease prevention? It's, of course, early diagnosis, um, of course, maybe at birth, and sus subsequently the, the treatment. Um, actually, uh, is your mic on? Uh, and now? Much better. Okay. A and the treatment. So... Um, while before coming to Fermo Fisher Scientific and now PPD, um, treating patients and diagnosing patients with lysosomal storage disorders at National Institutes of Health, um, understanding that uh, the most important, of course, to identify the disorders and patients, um, called disease odyssey is, is, is very long. Um, as soon as a patient is diagnosed, 
the treatment. And the current status is, of course, enzyme replacement therapy. You are very well aware. However, there is challenges. I'll name few uh, because, like, again, simply not enough time. Um, while they are effective uh, as a prevention of complications, there is still... Um, you know, winning of efficacy over time because of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, the enzyme replacement therapy, while help with storage of um, lysosomal uh, lipoproteins or proteins or complex molecules, it doesn't ad address the lysosomal uh, protein, the cell, cell membrane uh, defects and um, various type of lysosomal disorders. And of course, it doesn't cross blood uh, blood uh, brain barriers, for example, Hunter disease, mucopolysaccharidosis type 2, while enzyme replacement therapy exists, it doesn't address the significant neurodegenerative and cognitive dysfunction. So, um, the gene therapy is promising and curative and uh, seen a lot of activity right now, as mentioned by um, Dr. Miller today. Uh, uh, but very promising. However, there is challenges. Like, for example, for adenovirus vectors, there is issues with, um, of course, pre-existing seropositivity. And it's like general population, including the patient population between 30 to 80%, sometimes depends on, on a V type um, of serology. Uh, the same with safety and the burden of the uh, clinical trial for gene therapy with follow-up 10 to 15 years and the potential uh, safety concerns such as the uh, off-target genes, uh, mutagenesis and uh, cancerogenesis. Um, although there is uh, more modes are coming that is probably will be uh, available earlier than the gene therapies such as intrathecal and intracerebral ventricular enzyme replacement therapy and its trials for Hunter disease right now, um, cell implanted uh, with uh, enzymes to the patients. It's very promising um, as well to decrease immunogenicity. And, and of course, the combined treatment is you know, a successful application of enzyme therapy with small molecules, like one example of a Fabry disease, like ERT with uh, megalostat for targeting am amendable mutation in Fabry disease. Um, the touch base on the what is coming, and I think it will be a lot of attention, although it's very early, with it not technology-driven enzyme replacement therapies. Um, of course, the loading enzyme to, um, potentially could be um, minimizing adverse effect, effects and um, the nanoparticle. Can we go back to the slide? Okay, nanoparticles, they are biodegradable, also minimizing potential um side effects. So to name few, it is now um, mostly in the preclinical trials, liposomes, micelles, polymeric nanoparticles. Um, they they actually designed to protect enzyme um, capacity and enzyme activity that entering uh, organelles, uh, to particular to the lysosomes, and, and of, of course, to prevent uh, enzyme degradation, which is very, very important. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, diagnostic workup. Um, of course, a clinical presentation. When the, the patient comes into the clinicians, there are some of these morphological anatomical presentations, like coarse facial, because it's cold storage disease for the reason. Coarse facial features could be MPS, it could be diagnosed by just looking. However, of course, the rapid uh, confirmation is required, detection of the biomarkers, and uh, thankfully now genetic testing, either targeted genes or the whole genome sequencing. Uh, what are the novel drivers right now? The next generation sequencing with very rapid turnaround time. Uh, now it's more accessible and affordable. And uh, thank you for mentioning that, that uh, many states is actually uh, now covering for that. It's, and what I, I don't know if was mentioned, human metabolome project that um, actually um, available from 2005, however, um, mostly used on the high profile research institutions, mostly maybe applicable already to the uh, drug developers who has the potentials and a significant experience developing uh, treatment for inborners of metabolism. However, um, it's uh, enable um, newborn screening, of course, for many, many other inborners of metabolism and lysosomal storage disorders, named two such as uh, MPS type 1 and um, Crabbe disease. But I guess um, that would become extremely important for 
to bridge preclinical to clinical development. And maybe to finish uh, on the next slide, um, just to summarize, among of the early diagnosis, among of identification of the new disease genes, um, it's important for the development of the new therapies um, imaging of this on a cellular level, and it's and it's available. And uh, we know the many, many um, um, pharmaceutical large companies and small biotechs now is uh, targeting in the preclinical development, and hopefully it will be bridging to the uh, clinical trials as well. All the requires, of course, uh, validation uh, and approval from regulatory. Um, uh, proteomic and metabolomics that I already mentioned before, um, identification of the highly sensitive uh, biomarkers and functional of the lysosomes uh, would be very important for the new therapies. And like, again, there's more to say. Um, it's kind of became an elevated speech for me now. <laughs> each, each topic maybe require the whole sessions, but I'll stop here and present any questions. Thank you, Galena. I think... Thank yeah, so... Thank you. Um, and so we've heard, you know, initially uh, this morning from from the, the academic and clinical kind of perspective and, and then some industry and, and regulatory. So I'd like to then uh, uh, pivot a little bit to, you know, uh, Lori from a, as a patient advocate, uh, you know, what are some of the challenges, uh, opportunities and, you know, how can we uh Kind of round out the the, the circle with with the, the te technologies and industry and, and regulatory to uh, include patient and advocacy organizations in shaping some of the uh, therapeutics and, and moving forward. Hi, thank you. So the national patient advocacy organizations are here to represent and ensure the inclusion of the patient voice during all phases of drug development. It's important to bring in the patient voice from the beginning phases all the way through, you know, with patient services when we're getting ready for a launch. The organizations are here to provide feedback. They will provide feedback, and it's an excellent resource um, to rely upon. We're also recognizing the importance of including the caregiver experience because the patient isn't the only one that's affected in the family. Um, and really sharing their experience and viewpoint as a caregiver, as we did here earlier, um, you know, the child cannot advocate for themselves. Not all of the patients can advocate for themselves. Uh, so really just making sure that we're hitting on all aspects of that. Um, I think that we all recognize here in this room, you know, Neiman Pick included other lysosomal storage diseases. They're rare and fatal. We the pace of drug development is never going to be fast enough for our patients and their families. We need to ensure that industry is being transparent and sharing real and manageable expectations, um, you know, sharing the reality that this is not going to be as fast as we would hope. Uh, continuing engaging. I think the challenges that we see at our national level is the timing of drug development. We don't have time. The clinical trials are frustrating for families. Um, exclusion criteria, washout, placebos, fear of leaving a current experimental treatment. Those are all difficult, scary decisions for a patient and family to have to make. Um, looking at the overwhelming sense of um, figuring out the diagnosis, getting the diagnosis, how can families best get information how can they get to um, receive treatment with one of our, the experts? These are all difficult things for a family to quickly learn how to navigate when they've been thrown into the role of a caregiver and a parent with a rare disease. I think that, you know, just working together and coming together as a group is, you know, what we need to do and, you know, encourage you all to rely on your national organizations um, at every step of the process. Thank you, Laurie. I'm going to put a pin to that, uh, the last point that you made about collaborations, but I had a specific question to Dr. Jim Wilson. You know, uh, your presentation just before this one was incredibly inspiring. I agree with everything that you said. There's a lot of advancements happening. There's a lot of potential in this field, but I'm pretty sure there are significant challenges as well. Uh, I just wanted uh, from your, because you worked in academic field, uh, you, I guess, uh, have a uh, 
founded several companies focused focusing on uh, gene therapies for some of these diseases. What sort of challenges from uh, industry perspective, regulatory perspective, logistical perspective do you see, do you already experience and do you foresee that must be basically resolved uh, that enable these sort of uh, gene therapies to become more uh, available? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, you know, it, it depends on the disease and the product because there's a full spectrum. And and what we're really seeing now, and I I is I showed you the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot uh, to come. But there are uh, there's a lot of science. And in fact, this field is only at its beginning. It, it's, it's not mature. And the fact that it's not as mature does create some challenges because we don't even have standardization across product characterization, et cetera. Uh, but um, but but the fact that we do have a continuum, some programs that are much more mature than others. The advantage for me was uh, for those that are more mature, what will the challenges be from show, going from clinical proof of concept or even uh, possibly a market authorization to global access? Um, and and that's where we've we've put a lot of our effort. And 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 our view is that um, you know accessibility and global access is is why we're here. Um, and we read about uh, the pricing. We're not supposed to, I used to talk about pricing, but this is a barrier of you know two two million three three point two million dollars, and um, and 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 that is just not uh, practical or sustainable. So. So we actually created a foundation uh, to develop ultra orphan one and done treatments in a nonprofit setting and partner with industry. We have a partnership with Moderna where they're providing product to us for free. And we've tried it, but I don't think that's the solution. I think we have to develop um, a, a sustainable, justifiable business proposition. And from and from my point of view, there are really enormous opportunities here for us. Um, uh, and and there there are data now about the probability of success of a genetic medicine a cell versus a small molecule. It's three times greater. So what that means, if you're a developer, uh, you're not paying for those failures, which is what drives the cost of drug development up. Uh, so and then if we're smarter as we as we as we develop more experience. Uh, a genetic medicine, the chance or the risk of a failure is is much less, which means you're not paying for all the failures. Uh, and um, and I talked about the platforms that if we could develop this as platforms, uh, then information about uh, other members of the platform inform the others could simplify clinical development and also think about qualifying a manufacturing process rather than uh, uh, individual product. But money matters here. We have to be smart about uh, being efficient. You know, Zolgensma product, which is transformative, I my estimate is about three hundred fifty thousand dollars cost of goods. Um, well, there are products delivered another way, and which could be fifteen thousand in terms of so so being smart about uh, uh, about being efficient, safe. Um, but we have to be mindful that um, um, that we may price ourselves out of existence. One last issue. And I'm an academic, so I can I can talk uh, about commercialization, and you can just say I'm a, I'm a, I'm ill informed. But 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 the thing that's so incredible about genetic gene therapy and, and genetic medicine is, patient goes to the doctor, they get their treatment, and they go home. There's follow up, but there isn't repeated infusions into the CSF or repeated drugs or repeated infusions. That kind of treatment. Um, maybe maybe really well suited for uh, emerging markets where the public health infrastructure is not such that for an ASO, they come into the hospital and get a CSF injection every time. So the impact globally uh, could be even greater outside of countries that are uh, that are more affluent. And then commercial, you know, I, I was there. I, I was part of a trans NIH task force addressing this issue. And what we're really thinking about and what's happening is there are clinical centers of excellence where the trials are done globally and those will be the centers where the commercialization will occur and so and so you don't need to spend i'm looking at bear but yeah 30 percent of your budget on sales and marketing when it when it when you when you're dealing with rare diseases actually sales and marketing 
It's called social media and patient advocacy groups because a patient comes out of a trial yeah. and we read about it on Facebook. <laughs> so so we don't have to burn all that cash. And, and, and so there are, you know, we can rethink the way that we develop products. But I appreciate your question, but we and others in the space need to think about higher probability of success, working with health authorities, leveraging data, but coming up with much more efficient models to commercialize this product and distribute the product. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, uh, Jim, you talked about uh, a lot about leveraging data, and I, I had a follow-up question. I think perhaps this is the question I should be asking uh, to Tom uh, about you know uh, his experience working with CPATH on multiple programs where the idea is to leverage data to create drug development tools uh, to, to solve some of the issues pertaining to uh, pediatric, specifically neonatal drug development. When it comes to cell and gene therapies, what sort of drug development tools, what's, how can we best leverage uh, the data that currently exists and the data that is going to be available uh, given you know how many uh, new uh, clinical trials are coming up? Uh, they're going to be finished. But you know what sort of what what would be that most impactful sort of uh, leveraging of the data to create drug development tools that you envision uh, would would help in really turbocharging this one? Yeah, uh, thank you for for the question, and and I think it's it's maybe sometimes we we in in um, industry are are tempted to when when we talk about the real world data and real world evidence topic to immediately go towards how can we use this to control our studies, but I think in reality there are many other ways that we can um, uh, use available data. To, to de-risk um, e even further uh, the, these programs, as as Dr. Wilson just uh, just referenced to, and and further improve probability of technical success, as I often um, explain to our uh, our new folks coming into teams, um, heterogeneity is is not your friend in in drug development, and um, using um, large data sets like we have available allows us to ask questions and. Um, to to yet again uh, borrow um, Judy Ashner's term, um, endotype patient populations, um, wh which e with with in in which each endotype is uniquely homogenous um, to to minimize the signal relative to potential noise. Uh, this is uh, a, a place that I hope to see many of us uh, in this room and beyond go, um, because that will I think dramatically enhance um, probability of technical success be beyond the intrinsic. Um, uh, reduced risk of a, of a genetic medicine. Thank, thank you, Tom. And that, you know, kind of gives us a, a, a jumping point for the, for the next question for, for all the panelists, how then, you know, with, with the data and, and a platform in which we can utilize and, and uh, have a unified kind of voice with all the heterogeneity, how can we uh, collaborate with industry, regulatory bodies, academia, and patient advocacy groups to accelerate kind of the development of these disease-modifying tools? Um, we could start at the end and just move down this way, if that's okay. Sure. Um, that's a great question. It's a million, if not a billion or trillion dollar question. Um, I think, you know, initiatives like like this one are, are are really the first place to start um i think we all have a lot to learn from one another and um a lot of that learning has taken place yesterday and already today um and i think the um the openness of the dialogue i think certainly from the fda perspective is really something that that we find to be critical um you know it it seems like a, a really fundamental thing but um this is this is really tough business and you really can't over communicate. Um, so um, we want to ensure that we are engaging all the relevant stakeholders in um, in our in our regulatory um, review. Um, and and really, you know, these these really granular questions about context of use, about fitness um, for use, uh, in particular indications. We're really, you know, living through a, a massive paradigm shift for for so many of these uh, diseases and indications. You know, route of administration, mechanism of action, study design from A to Z. Every element of of drug development for uh, for gene and cell therapies is 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 different um, uh, in in um, in so many critical ways. Um, so, um, so it, really, it's a it's a it's a perspective change um, for us certainly um, at FDA, and I think it's um, a doubling down on on our efforts to um, to communicate across 
um, industry academia and with um, the most important constituency, which of course is the is the patient. I think from the national advocacy standpoint, we need to ensure that the community is working together collaboratively through the national organization. Um, we need to be a united front. We cannot have fractures ex all the time, but especially when communicating directly with regulatory, it's important to um, funnel through your national organization. You're here. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and, and, and talking to colleagues in the biotech, my colleagues in the biotech space, we've privately, but maybe not as much publicly, uh, conceded that um, uh, business development, as we saw it before, is not going to work here. And also in the tech transfer offices, et cetera. So, so we have to reconsider how we can enable uh, so that we can succeed, uh, which means that we're going to have to uh, uh, be more generous and, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a royalty of 10%, maybe it'll be a half a percent, but it's not zero. And, and, and if we're not smarter about that, uh, then we're not going to have a business. Um, the second is something that you guys could do incredibly effectively is to create a forum so that we can define pre-competitive pre space and to push the boundaries on what pre-competitive space is. And let's compete with one another not on on an assay or a natural history study. Let's compete on what the what the differentiating technology is, and and then use the patient advocacy groups to push pre competitive space because that'll make everything a lot easier and cheaper. Thank you, Jim. I think this uh, creating of pre competitive space is exactly what our newly launched consortium actually, at least in part, uh, intends to do. Thank you. Um, so I think it really is about collaboration, um, you know, through, as has been said, events like this, as well as through so many other um, pathways and opportunities. Um, there's a lot that was discussed yesterday as far as how different um, international regulatory agencies collaborate. And that is obviously important when we're dealing with rare diseases and the um, need for worldwide trials, um, collaborating with everybody who has a interest to advance the science um, from sponsors, academics, and obviously the patients and their advocates. Um, and then the other major thing is accepting the time where we're at. This is obviously um, an exciting time for regenerative medicine. And I think it's also an exciting time in the sense that there are more and more opportunities and pathways um, to develop good tools that are fit for purpose. Um, through PDUFA 7, there are more regulatory opportunities and programs, and we hope that everybody takes advantage of them. Thanks. Well, um, by the nature now working for the contract research organization, exposing and being exposed to to, to many first to humans, um, you know, review the designs and and um, uh, enrollment of the patients. I think one is um, challenging uh, to shorten the time of um, you know starting the first in human trials and of course economical that refer patients referral so um, um encouraging that the patients because you know it's it's rare disorder sometimes uh, small academic centers one to two patients with certain diagnosis for larger academic centers maybe five to ten and usually patients are not referred if could be first in human trial like that would be opportunities to conduct the trial in certain centers or many centers if it's later stages, but for the phase one, um, that is a significant challenge. And I think the uh, ask to the community, uh, particular to the uh, um, treating physician and principal investigators to be open to the patient referrals. So as as um, as challenging yet exciting as the R part of the equation is, as we start to think about what full development looks like through registration, um, I, I think that is as equally as complicated for a number of the reasons that I and, and others touched on. 
Um, uh, so I, I would encourage um, all the sponsors in the room to really start thinking about your development strategy um, very early in in the game as you're approaching um, uh, clinical supply for your for your first in human study. As Dr. Hart just mentioned, um, there are through Padufa Seven, there are a number of um, new programs and new ways to interface with with um, health authorities um, that allow for maybe not yet quite iterative exchange. Um, Dr. Marks touched on a, a pilot program that's that's underway there, um, but um, but more rapid exchange and and something closer towards real time feedback. So it would encourage uh, folks to interact with uh, their key health authorities early and often. Thank you, Tom. Um, I just wanted to have one last question, and this is something that I've already asked to our um, uh, CBER colleagues, but I wanted to follow up with uh, at least a little bit of industry and academic perspective too, and that basically pertains to you know, when you're doing these uh, gene therapy clinical trials in MEM. If not most, then definitely in many cases, you have to balance immediate safety versus long-term efficacy considerations uh, because some of those diseases might be manifesting slightly later on in life, right? So efficacy considerations might be long-term, but safety considerations are going to be immediate. How do you, in a clinical setting, whether from industry side of the things or from academic side of the things, balance mm -hmm. those sort of a competing uh, priorities uh, uh, any any thoughts, Tom? And then I'm going to follow up with similar uh, to to Jim. Yeah, so I, I, I'll continue on the same thread that I that I was in. Right? I mean, your 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 I, your um, IND enabling package, you know, should should give uh, you some hints as to key areas from a safety perspective that you you need to prioritize in in early right. surveillance. So um, I would encourage everybody to confirm their their respective approach because it will be different with every program. But you know, if you have a, a robust uh, pre IND package, it should at least give you some sense of direction as to where you need to focus your your primary lens for safety surveillance or in early exposures. Great, thanks, um, Galena. Any comments from you? Um, if any, no, I, I, okay, cool, uh, Jim. Any thoughts from uh, academic standpoint? Because you have been involved in many many of these uh, clinical trials. So my um, our, our approach and my advice to others that have gotten into the field, for example, of stem cells or editing, is at the very beginning appreciate the fact that no matter what you uh, put in your IND, you? sorry uh, that that no matter what you put into your IND enabling uh, package, you really probably don't know what the risks are. And until we develop a human experience, it's uh, it's hard to know. And so we think there's a high premium on substantial unmet need early. Um, and um, and the sponsors that uh, go more, which are often smaller markets, but the sponsors who try early to go with larger markets where the unmet need is less, I think are gonna be met with a lot of headwinds. So careful selection of the disease so that in light of risks that may be unknown, there may be the you know, potential justification is really important. Great, thank you. Although we're at time, I just wanted to see if somebody in the audience had any questions, I can certainly, yes, please go ahead. Um, as an engineer, Wally Block from the University of Wisconsin, by the way, um, as an engineer, I've seen both prevention and cure. I see prevention does make sense, perhaps if you cure a genetic problem before symptoms arrive. But as an American taxpayer, prevention to me sounds like, you know, choosing tofu instead of red meat. And it seems like cure is semantically the term that that should be used. So I'm just curious from the FDA perspective. Um, so again, it's going to depend upon what the specific disease program is, but we do know that for uh -huh. some conditions, we, they are rapidly, rapidly progressive. And currently the standard of care may be essentially a hematopoietic stem cell transplant very, very early on. And so essentially for some diseases, a gene therapy early on could be an alternative to a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. There are other diseases where 
essentially, you have products, which we've seen and talked about, where you're targeting for their, um, where you think they're going to have their greatest action. And so for some disease courses, you can have a product that will act um, to stabilize and work later in the disease course. Um, Some products can potentially even reverse when treated later in the disease course. Other products will only be potentially effective if they are used early before you have begun maybe a inflammatory cascade or you have substantial buildup and accumulation. So it is looking at the specific product and disease and making sure that there is a favorable benefit risk. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just um, add to that, you know, this this issue about prevention from from the, the standpoint of an academic purist who studies prevention, that's not me. Um, they they resolve several levels of, of prevention. The, the one you referenced about, you know, our heart healthy diet, preventing the onset of cardiovascular disease would be primary prevention. So here, this is more in the space of secondary or tertiary efforts where you have a genetic disease and um, advanced screening, early screening is meant, as Dr. Hart was emphasizing, to um, uh, to address symptoms um, early in a disease course. So um, so there's, you know, quite a bit of complexity to, to how people actually interpret that that term prevention. So understandable that it's it's not quite clear. Great. Thank you so much, Gavin. Matthew Allen with National mm-hmm. MPS Society. Prevention may not be clear in some disorders, but the treatment model for lysosomal storage diseases with neuropathic involvement is preventative. If you wait until clinical signs have already shown, you will have a very suboptimal response. Something I'd like to bring up that has not entered into this, the first step to access is diagnosis. For the LSDs, almost all of them are very amenable to newborn screening. There is a broken system in this country. There are state public health labs who were at risk of losing CLIA certification this last year. As an example, in MPS1, where you can get a positive predictive value screen in newborn screening of 95 to 100%, Our approvals for drug was 2003. It was a six-year lag to get a nomination in 2001 or nine submitted. It was uh, uh, until 2016, the nomination was accepted at the federal level. We will be 10 years getting states to roll out just to meet 95% screening of patients in this country. This system must be fixed. You can get a protocol and you can get a drug developed, but if you can't find the patients and deliver it in a timely fashion, you will fail. I don't know where this gets fixed. I don't know if HRSA needs a foundation associated with it to help drive progress in this area, but it is a systemic issue and it must be addressed. The other issue that hasn't come up is these therapies, at least in the U.S. setting, are only going to be administered in maybe half a dozen localities. Many of these patients are going to be on Medicaid. Access to those treatments and to those states is barred and is a significant barrier. Furthermore, if we get timely development of therapies, it's going to be with accelerated approval on biomarkers, ensuring that CMS will guarantee payments for these so that confirmatory trials can enroll rapidly and efficiently is absolutely necessary to gaining full market approval my observations only, not those of the National MPS Society. Thank you, Matthew. No, uh, great, great points, uh, great comments. And certainly, you know, these are some of the things that we hope to discuss within our Lysosomal Diseases Consortium, and let's have the conversation going. But I do appreciate your comments. Hi, Judy Ashner, Hackensack Meridian Health. And no, I didn't coin the term endotype. I just talk about it a lot. (laughs) So I want to make um, a comment to something that you said, Tom, um, which is about how challenging, indeed, it is to do long-term follow-up studies, particularly in neonates, but honestly, in this mobile society of ours in this country, at any rate, Uh almost for any disease. And I, I just want to put my perspective out there that Things have completely changed, and it is one of the few gifts of the pandemic, because institutions who had to shut down uh, during the height of uh, the first COVID wave, all of our ongoing uh, in-person follow-up visits, very quickly learned to pivot to remote visits and found that 
follow-up was even better than it was when we made families come in, even if we paid them for parking and their time, and are now very, very successful doing pretty detailed um, long-term follow-up for patients without needing them necessarily to come on site very often. And I think that's a potential game changer for some of the challenges we face in the past for long-term follow-up. And then I want to raise a topic um, that also hasn't been touched upon that really speaks to uh, industry academic collaboration. And I'll try to do this without naming the company or the gene therapy, but we all are aware of um, gene therapy uh, industry or companies that have shut down uh, after some patients have been enrolled in clinical trials. So at my site, we have two such study subjects, one who flew to us from Mexico for this gene therapy. And now this company is no longer in business. And um, the academic institution has to figure out how we meet our responsibility to these patients long term. And just wondering about the thoughts of the panel on how to address these kinds of situations, which I worry because the <laughs> business model is challenging, could continue to happen, making you know some sites reluctant to do this or putting the academic institution that thinks they've got you know the power of, of industry behind them uh, at risk. Anybody have any thoughts? Doc? I mean, the, the the second point is really uh, a thorny issue. I um, it's the fragility of biotech, and um, and I don't think there's a global solution. But there is a company that that went bankrupt. Try uh, two trials in pro progress, um, and uh, we have a foundation, and we actually then acquired the asset for like zero. And we, we acquired the programs. Our foundation is, and then we're working with the academics to try to, uh, we had to go through a liquidation court to get it. And it didn't cost us very much. Uh, so, um, so maybe foundations can, um, can, can play, uh, can play a role there, uh, together with academics that academics may have more infrastructure. Um, uh, but we acquired the asset so we could follow up the patients and give the data to the, um, advocacy group. So, um, I think highlighting this problem, you sort of change your tone when, when you were talking about it, but I don't think we should change our tone. I think uh, I think we need to make sure when that happens that we all double down and we get access to the data and we do everything we can to follow up the patients. And can this consortium that you had spoken about earlier between multiple sort of rare disease advocacy groups um, perhaps play a role in this? Thing? It could, but a consortium can, but at the end of the day, there needs to be a uh, a group that will uh, take responsibility for following up um, and and going through the legal logistics because we had to pay about fifty thousand dollars in lawyers fees just to get there, um, uh, or maybe take a different approach. But it it is carnage out there right now for exactly what you talked about. Yeah. And and I think we should we should take that as a as a follow up as well because I think it, it will require multi stakeholder consideration. This is not a simple uh, problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment briefly on the previous comment um, about trying to get this testing done earlier and identifying more patients. And as I mentioned previously, there are a number of initiatives to use whole genome sequencing for newborn screening and be able to detect thousands of different disorders. And everybody's very excited about it but there's two things to be a little bit cautious about. One is Boston Children's and the Brigham and others did do the BabySeq project, which was going into newborn nurseries and trying to consent parents to have their kids sequenced to see if there were any pediatric disorders or adult disorders that they could um, detect. And I think 90% of the parents said no. So they were very concerned <clears throat> about learning that their child was going to have Alzheimer's at 60 or a variety of other things. So I think certainly as we think about some of these things and people are moving ahead with some of these newborn screenings, 
um, we have to think, well, what are you going to disclose to the families? And uh, with those, those children actually consenting until they're 18, maybe they don't want to know some of these things that are going to occur. And also some of the ethical aspects, you know, then uh, who is this genetic data available to? Um, can companies then search the genome and say, well, with all these possible things that are going to go on, we're not going to give this patient health insurance, uh, for instance, because we think there is a risk of hunting his career later on, and we don't want to do that. Um, the Texas Law Review actually wrote a very interesting article on some of the ethics with these databases now being widely open to law enforcement and people to be able to search the genome, find relatives who may or may not have uh, committed crime. So, you know, I think there's a lot of information you're using just the proband. So you're not also looking at the parents at the same time to know if whether some of these variants are uh, pathogenic or not, or just a normal variant. So then you're going to have to be doing a lot more testing with that. So there's a lot of issues. I, I agree. It's incredibly important and people are looking at this seriously, but we have to keep up with some of the social, political, and ethical issues with that too. Great. Thank you so much, John. And I think we have significantly exceeded the time that we had for the panel. Apologies for that, but I think we can finally uh, call it an uh, end for the session. I do greatly appreciate everybody's comments, thoughts, and especially Tom, your presentation and panelists' comments. Thank you so very much. Uh, we're going to have a lunch break.